I hope that the live stream doesn't stutter terribly much, she said, remembering to turn on the microphone. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. But the um, I have been going around and around and around and around with um, YouTube help. I have sent them screenshots. I have sent them videos. I have sent them so many different things to show them where this particular error is happening. And they always sign their emails from Francesca. And uh, your mute wasn't on. It was me. Uh, they always send their emails, Francesca, and I finally started writing back to the hive mind, also known as Francesca, because it was clear that it wasn't a human. It was just a name that they put on their emails. It's kind of like talking to Cigna. Uh, AT was asking me before this all got started if my woes with Cigna actually got any better. Uh, in fact, they got worse. I got confirmation from the HR department that um, this appears to be correct and that there is no recourse or appeal process for somebody in a situation like me where they have to take the brand name medication and can't afford the brand name medication because this is ridiculous. And um, so I'm penalized for, I'm, I'm penalized for being uh, intolerant to the generic of a particular type of drug. And the really ironic part is that if you go online and you see the, uh, if you search for the, the particular issue that I'm having and that drug, you find that there are thousands of people all over the planet who have the same side effect from the generic. But, you know, there's no difference between the generic and the brand, obviously, because that would be unethical. I have a thing about logical fallacies. Ooh, which reminds me, I have a funny to share with you. Because if I don't laugh, I'll cry all the time. Uh, I think I talked about this on the podcast a long time ago, but I didn't talk about it on the Crafty Chat. This is a book by Ali Almasawi. It is called An Illustrated Book of Bad Arguments. It is the best book ever. It is all about logical fallacies. It's called Learn the Lost Art of Making Sense. And so he does these goofy little animations, or not animations, um, cartoons. I'm trying to let the camera focus. And this one said, <clears throat> this is for equivocation. The queen told the curious little crane that she could have jam every other day, but never today, since today was not any other day. Which I love. A lot of it sounds like Lewis Carroll, which shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. But, um, God, I love this book. It's just so much fun. And it was, I think it was a Kickstarter book, or I know it had an interesting origin. Anyway, love love. So that's one thing. And I know the artwork in it is just fantastic. It is, it is just one of those things that makes me smile. So that we love. I actually started making memes, logical fallacy memes over the, the last weekend because I was so frustrated with the world. And it's fairly easy to find logical fallacies out in the world now. So I decided to exploit that. And, uh, and I'll have those popping up uh, various points on the, the interwebs. And um, yes, yes, his art does. A.T. just wrote, it reminds me of the old Looney Tunes cartoons. And it does. His artwork is very much like the, the old, 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 old school Looney Tunes cartoons. It's a lot of fun. And it's not, I mean, it's a hardback book. It's very nicely done, but it's very thin. And yet he's got, let's see. He's got a good cross section of, you know, the best of the logic of fallacies. Uh, straw man, appeal to irrelevant authority. Oh, oh, the scores and scores that we've got of this equivocation, false dilemma, 
uh, hasty generalization, appeal to ignorance, the no true Scotsman argument, which had a different name when I first learned it. I'll see if I can find that again. Uh, genetic fallacy, guilty by association, affirming the consequent, uh, the ad hoc, prop, ad hoc ergo propter hoc, appeal to hypocrisy, slippery slope, appeal to the bandwagon, ad hominem, circular reasoning, or begging the question, she said, angry at everyone in the world who says begging the question incorrectly. Um, composition and division. Because I have a podcast, so I get to be angry about begging the question. And if you want to be angry about a different logical fallacy, get a podcast. I highly recommend it. You'll, be, you'll feel better. <laughs> uh, where's the no true Scotsman? Because that one was funny. The fallacy was coined by Anthony Flew in his book, Thinking About Thinking, where he gives the following example. Hamish is reading the newspaper and comes across a story about an Englishman who has committed a heinous crime, to which he reacts by saying, no Scotsman would do such a thing. The next day he comes across a story about a Scotsman who has committed an even worse crime. Instead of amending his claim about Scotsman, he reacts by saying, no true Scotsman would do such a thing. If you were a real fill in the blank, when an attacker maliciously redefines a category, knowing well that by doing so he or she is intentionally misrepresenting it, the attack becomes reminiscent of the strongman fallacy. I did learn that in eighth grade, that a lot of fallacial arguments are interconnected. There's a lot of overlap between them. Uh, very few logical fallacies are pure. <laughs> and so many things in life are rarely pure these days, it seems. So I love that book. I also love a couple of other things that I wanted to show you. Brownies. Oh, and Kathy, the book name again. The Illustrated Book of Bad Arguments. It is by Ali Almasawi. And if I can get the you can see my mouth smile. And uh, I love, I love his art. I love his book. It's a really nice little introduction to why logical fallacies are so much fun. Because they are. And it's not just a game of gotcha. It's like, oh, that's why that always seemed wrong. You know, you hear somebody making an argument that sounds like it should be logical, reasonable, honest, clear. But something in the back of your mind is going, mm, maybe not so much. That's, that's where you find out why your brain was kicking in going, hmm. But what will never, ever cause you a second of woe, except possibly for your hips, gluten-free brownies. If you have to go to a party and bring something gluten-free for people, oh, I've mentioned this before. I actually have the box now because I just made some. The whole house smells like brownies. Betty Crocker, somebody on the Betty Crocker staff, like vice president several years back, became a celiac. And <laughs> I know they're in the regular Betty Crocker aisle. And so good. You could never, ever, ever tell that you are not eating regular brownies. And they come with tiny little tiny little chocolate chips inside the little mini chips too so good so uh because everything else sucked so bad this week i decided brownies it's a good thing they also have becky crocker also has um yellow cake and chocolate cake mixes now and i know that they're more expensive and i know that that stinks um it is because of the ingredients and the purity thing like you can't have it be cross contaminated with regular flour uh, truly there are people who are celiac who if like flour goes poof in a room which you know flour is going to do if you're going to cook with regular flour um the whatever the poof was that landed on the counter that can that can make somebody with celiac deathly ill i am not that sensitive i am sensitive which stinks. But one of the things that I am not sensitive to is mommy's juice boxes. I am decorating these things 
for the swim party following my son's bar mitzvah service so that we can sit, all the moms can sit over in the little glassed in area for mom land while the kids go swim in the indoor pool that has the water slide and stuff. And I'm just going to bring decorated mommy's juice boxes with straws <laughs> because I think we deserve it. <laughs> I have no idea whether I'm going to get away with this or not. But I, I was trying to find, like, could I do contact paper or something like that to cover up the, the juice box? But the juice box, the grape juice box. Mommy's juice boxes. I know, right? The, the part about it that made me think, oh, the contact paper idea isn't going to work, is that it's not an actually, it's not a regular shape. And I think the lighting actually finally helps on this because you can see that the... The edges are both, there's a squared off part of it, but then there's also the tapered part of it and kind of a rounded part, both the top and bottom. So even the bottom, you can see the sides kind of bulb out. And I thought, oh man, if I try and put contact paper on here, it's just going to, it's not going to stick right or it's not going to stay on. So then I thought... <laughs> paper towel roll. This is one paper towel cut in half. And then I just taped the, the two halves together over. And this is, this is a paper towel roll that I think thing to started to decorate a thousand years ago with, with my nail polish, strangely enough. So it's got goofiness on it right now. And I will, um, I will endeavor to come up with some kind of other decorativeness. Maybe I can put contact paper over the top of these actually because I don't want them to stand out and be too flashy. I worry that that will draw untoward attention but mommy's juice boxes red grape and white grape seemed right <laughs> especially after the month we're having. Oh my god. I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone but boy am I tired of it. I also have these, which I got a thousand years ago at Joann's or Michael's, they are little Chinese, like the Chinese food boxes, but they're the color does such pretty colors. And I'm trying to figure out, aside from candy, I know I can put other stuff in here, but we thought we'd do those at people's places at the table. I also just found out I'm going to really actually have to do a seating chart, but the place that we're going to isn't, it's rustic. So it's not like there are tables and tablecloths. <gasps> Missy grape and stain-free grape. I like the way you think. It's true. So I we have we have been trying to figure out how to get people to sit in a localized area. Maybe we'll just we've, <laughs> we've got little rubber ducks except instead of decks, they're little rubber unicorns. And they didn't come yet. Otherwise, I would be showing those to you. And we were thinking of maybe putting a symbol on the bottom and doing rooms that are symbols because there's three different rooms. And, and that way we can kind of localize the chaos that way. I don't know. But we're trying to come up with something. Actually, the, the place that we're doing it figured out how to do a kid's table in one room. So that'll localize some of the crazy and it'll keep the kids in one place. And then we're going to have a little coloring station for the kids where they can make their own little unicorn horn hats. So they're the little bands around like a headband, but they have a, a unicorn horn sticking up. So I'll be getting some of those to show you too. I'm, I hope they're here by, I hope they're here by next week. That would be scary. Otherwise that would not make me happy. Um, so that's all of that. And when I went to Brussels, I got a present for uh, another podcaster. She does a, the Great Beer Podcast. She's a lovely, lovely person and hilarious. And I found Choco Beer, Belgian chocolate. Choco Beer. These are little, little, little beer-shaped bottles that have Belgian beer in them covered in chocolate. I have no idea how these are going to taste, but 
I'm not going to find that in the United States. So that was fun. And <laughs> AT, AT wrote that her niece used one of those unicorn headbands at Halloween to wear to work. I think that's an excellent idea. Did she color it at work or at home before she went to work? That's fun. And then the next thing, because right now it's all about all about the bar mitzvah. And everybody else is busy today. So here I is. I found a local place that makes what we were talking about last week. Macaron. Wrong. These are almond flour and egg white concoctions. So let's see which one is going to show up the best contrast on the, probably this, on the screen. So these are, this one is a, a red velvet. They call it a red velvet macaron, but it's not a red velvet cake. It is, again, mm, how can I get that? I have to turn up the light. So it is a uh, almond flour and egg white top and bottom, like a shell. And then this one has uh, vanilla bean buttercream inside. I know. That one's really good. And then they have, you know, the ones that are supposed to be all, like, healthy. So that one is... Um, Berry and lavender, I can't remember which berry, on the outside, and then blackberry jelly on the inside, or blackberry, what, ganache? No, it's not ganache. Uh, confit, something like that. Um, this one is apricot and apricot. Mm -hmm. I know. <gasps> There's Tara. Hi, Tara. I'm sorry I didn't ping you today. It has been. Yes, it has. This one is all vanilla bean. Vanilla bean top and base vanilla bean buttercream. Let's see if I can remember all of these. This one was, this one is a strawberry and chocolate. So it is in fact, dark chocolate middle and dip and strawberry outside. Uh, can't remember what this one is. Something with buttercream. Might be. Oh, this was the rose water. This is a rose water one. I've never had anything flavored flavored with rose water. So I'll let you know. And oh good. There's a lot of people who had a night of it. I'm sorry you were caught up in that. This one was. Oh, see, and I thought I was gonna remember all these. This was the peanut butter. It might be peanut butter and jelly. I don't know if you can see, but there is a layer, a thin, thin layer of something on the base before you get to the, the creamy innards. I can't remember what that one is. And this one is peach and caramel. So I know it's tragic. It's horrible. And I'm absolutely traumatized, as is everyone in the family, but I'm going to cut these into quarters with a very sharp knife and we're going to taste test them and then decide which ones we want to have in um, the little gift baggies for people who are coming in from out of town who are staying at the hotel and put in like a bottle of water and a couple of mackerel but the colors uh, the colors that were the ones that we saw over and over and over again in France were and in Brussels too were those three. So again, gluten-free, almond flour, and egg whites and sugar is what the tops are made out of, and everything on the inside is either buttercream or fruit filling. So good. And, um, and sometimes you can tell, like on that one, you can tell that these were piped. They were just piped out onto a, a baking sheet and that they they fluff up quite a bit. Because that isn't that isn't like the edges were touching, and when you when they broke it apart, it 
it did the little breaky edgy stuff that's just because it expanded that one's got caramel on top but that one it's harder to tell that it was piped so so that's what we're doing with that and i've got my hair back up in the back again today because boy is it hot and humid today and i have made headway on the infernal vest. There we go. I'm almost done with the first row of, of um, cables and they're very subtle. They're way more subtle than I thought they would be right now. Um, but I think that's because I don't have the uh, span of just knitting in between them as I go vertically. And it's going to be cable, 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 and then in between those up 15 rows it's gonna be cable 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 so they'll be offset against each other these little vertical cables so that's what it's looking like and i've been trying to figure out is this still on the right side check this out i don't know what it is that i'm doing seat down down towards the bottom edge of my stitches. It looks like those stitches are twisted. Do you see how some of them are leaning one direction and others are leaning another direction? It's not the lighting and it's not your imagination. They actually are looking, they are looking that way. So what I started doing was going through with, just with the needle and putting it under I want to make sure I'm putting it under the right stitches. <laughs> Just putting the needle in underneath the, the front loops of several, several stitches or sometimes just one, sometimes two or three, and then really, truly just yanking the bejujus out of it and then re-pulling it down and stuff and it realigns the stitch pretty well most of the time but there are like there you can tell the difference if i can hold this up right the two stitches that i have my fingers on are the ones that i realigned and you can see the ones on either side are still tweaked i don't know what it is that i'm doing not a clue i'm not twisting the stitches i know the difference between i know the difference between those two things um i'm not knitting into the front or the back incorrectly i'm knitting consistently the way that it should be knit i don't know if that's a yarn tension thing if i'm just holding the yarn poorly or sometimes i pull a stitch through further than others i have no idea but it seems to be a bigger problem at the beginning in fact like this actually looks like it's a completely different stitch pattern look at that Right? I mean, that's not my imagination, is it? That doesn't look like like up here where I straighten it out. You can see two consistent rows or two consistent columns of stitches. And then at the bottom, it's all bleh. It's like basket weave, except it's not. I love, Tara, that your attitude is <laughs> that mm, will block right out. I keep telling myself that, but it makes me nervous since it's not mine. And this isn't a shawl, so it's not going to be um, blocked to within an inch of its life. So it does make me kind of nervous. <laughs> AT. <laughs> AT doesn't see it. That makes me feel better, AT, except that I'm giving it back to a woman who's a knitter and, and she will see it. So I appreciate the vote, though. <laughs> oh. Ooh, uh, Tara, you said nerdy nummies. Uh, Ro makes them in her YouTube channel. She makes the macaron thingies, like teaches people how to make them. That would be so cool. Ooh. What is the ramen noodle effect? I mean, I know what ramen noodles are, but what is the effect that they have? Um, I'm looking to see if there is anything else that I have to share 
aside from grapefruit. Oh, and a cookbook. Oh, cool. All right. So Nerdy Nummies, N-U-M-M-I-E-S. And Ro, her name is R-H-O. She has a YouTube channel. This is good news. I don't have to go look because I would like to be able to make these suckers. They, they're so pretty. I love that. Um, latest news on the 1984 front. I am not going to be doing the podcast all by my lonesome. I am going to be doing them with Justin. Justin, who has been doing the editing on Craftlet, who I love. He was a philosophy and English major, so he's going to be a great addition. And you've been hearing his voice doing the um, book talk begins at whatever, whatever time um, for the last several months. Uh, it just got to be silly that he would have to wait for me to come in and record the time code uh, when sometimes I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off or flying somewhere. And that didn't help any. Um, oh, ramen noodles, frogged yarn before being re-knit. Uh, frogged yarn being re-knit before being rewashed, And you're right. That was yarn that had been used previously. That explains a lot. Thank you. So that is why I had the weird, the weird looking stuff. Um, I'm checking my schedule because this week we have episode 444. We have today, we have episode 444. Episode 444 is chapters 58 and 59. And then I'm traveling. Tara, you're so awesome. Thank you. I am dumping things out of my book. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes. So next week, Tuesday the 7th, you will not see me. I will not be here because I will be flying to New Orleans for the first time in my life. I will be going to New Orleans. So uh, no crafty chat, no craft lit next week at all, because there's no way I'll be able to pull it off. But after that, the week after that, we will be here for the rest of March. And I think that's it. I'm trying to remember if there's anything else I had put down that I needed to tell you. I I think I got all the good stuff. Oh, last question. So you know how you can do the uh, sheep's wool or evidently alpaca and um, <laughs> can I have crawfish etouffee or do they have to start the etouffee with a, a roux? because I'll guarantee you they do it with flour. I have to be careful. I wasn't able to eat hardly anything in France. Gator tail? Oh, yeah, Kathy, I know I'm kind of worried about that. The the going to New Orleans for a conference sometimes means you don't get to see much at all. We'll be close to the French Quarter, but not in the French Quarter, so I don't... I just want to go get a drink and listen to some music. That's my whole goal. <laughs> Fried gator bites. Ah! It's like chicharrones. Yeah, I have no clue either. I don't know about the roux. Oh, I know Andrew loves jambalaya. Um, soap covered with sheep's wool. This was actually soap that had been covered with alpaca wool, according to the tag that was on it. And some people in the family beat the bejujus out of it and uh there's a hole there and a hole there and i was thinking if i get these wet i can stick another um bar of soap in there is it possible to re felt with new with new wool refilt over a hole like that? Would I have to do needle felting? Because I could do like sideways needle felting so I don't go directly into the soap. Or should I try and do wet felting and just wrap wool um, going around and then going the long way and wet felt the bajujus out of that onto the new bar of soap? I see Tara saying, yes. I now pause for more information. Because 
it smells good. And because it was alpaca, it's really, really soft. But I think because it was alpaca, it was also a weaker, a weaker felt. Because if I really stuck my fingers in here and pulled, it will just rip right apart. Okay, so go wet. It will help the soap bind to the wool. Excellent news. Because I want to keep as much of the soft alpaca-ish part uh, available. It was really nice. And it, I wonder if I could find more soap that smelled like that. It was really good. My mom got it. It's the um, goat milk, goat milk soap. I don't know where she got it. Somewhere in Arizona, I think. Highly recommend. Uh, I think that's it for this week. I will endeavor to come back with something from New Orleans that is crafty to show you. Oh, and I just found out literally like two hours ago that there is a consignment craft store across the river in uh, Lambertville. So by the next time I see you, I hope to get the skinny on this place because if, because the weather is nice, we've had bikes going by all day long. Uh, if it's a thing, consignment craft stores where you can take your UFOs, and put them up on consignment. I don't know if it's a thing. I don't know if this is unique. But if it's a thing, we need to start tracking them because I know lots of craftlet people who could use a place to take their UFOs and let somebody else enjoy and finish. You know, leave the needles in it. Just take it. Stick it in a, a nice, clear plastic bag. and uh, You know, AT, I actually don't think that there is enough thickness where uh let's see i'm trying to figure out how i can show you like the part up here that is still all in one piece is is thick and nubby and the part down here where the hole appeared you can tell just from the edges that there's a good half inch three three quarters of an inch of it wasn't very thick to begin with it was just inconsistently felted and like back here so there's the front the flip side of it you can feel that a hole could easily start pretty much right away so i think i was going to have to add add wool no matter what i mean i have alpaca but i don't have the kind that will felt well i have the i had the same problem last week there's a wakaya and there's meh, meh, meh. and i think the wakaya is the one that's very very silky and that's the one that i've got it doesn't felt very well at all oh <laughs> yes I'm sure I could pull a fart, a UFO or 17. I've been going through my stuff and I'm trying to figure out like, well, what am I going to do with this? Am I ever going to finish it? Is it worth keeping around? And part of it, you know, I don't like quitting. I think, I think I should. I think it's time. I think I'm done. They've been sitting undone for seven, eight, nine, well, 10 years, some of them. So Oh, well. Um, so that's it. Go make macaron and um, send me recommend recommendations for what to do in New Orleans, if you have any. And, um, and Tara, I could send you all of my UFOs, but it would require a wooden crate like unto the one at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's... That's what I'm talking about. Oh, that's right. AT, you've been packing. Oh, my God. Oh, packing up all your fat quarters. How many boxes of fat quarters did you have? Oh, hello, Toshi. Oh, my gosh. You just made it because I am a, I am in the process of signing off. Yay. I know the craft literati are the best. Yay. Oh. <sighs> Holy cow. I'm getting buzzed from everywhere. Ah. All right. Stay safe. Stay safe. Take care of each other. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. Oh, yeah. I understand that, AT. Having lots of, lots of stashes, even if they're not huge, lots of stashes for different crafts can take up a lot of space. All right. Have a great week. 
uh, I'll talk to you on Friday on the podcast. The two chapters this week I've been waiting for for so long. It's I'm so excited. And then uh, and then a break for a week. But you get two chapters, so you can take a break for a week. And um, and then I'll see you again uh, March seventh, March fourteenth. Oh, Ides of Marchishness. And I'll have uh, I'll have more news about the next Craftlet tour soon, and all that kind of stuff. All right, have a great one. I will talk to you guys soon. Take care. Bye.